Um, always like to start from the beginning. Just talk to me a little bit about your upbringing and your childhood. What was it like? My childhood, um, you know, I truly am the coal miner's daughter, born and raised in southern West Virginia. Um, you know, came playing sports, play. I have all boy cousins, so I just I, I went out. I played basketball, baseball, football with the, with my cousins, and um, you know, focused on sports a lot and just kind of hung out. You know, nothing special. When did you start getting into boxing? Was you a boxing fan as a kid, or? I really wouldn't say I was a fan. Uh, my dad was a fan, so I watched the fights with him. You know, back in the day when you had ABC Wild Water Sports fights. You know, Muhammad Ali was fighting on free TV. Uh, those kind of things. So I would watch those fights with my dad. But to say that I was a fan, that you know, if the fights are on, I have to be in front of the TV. Uh, I don't. I don't remember that being the case. Did you say you, you watched like the Muhammad Ali fights and things like that? You watched them with your father. Did they sort of later down the line when you started boxing? Did any of those moments sort of come back to you? And did you feel like actually was it like a you know psychological thing that you always were going to start boxing, but you didn't realize till later on in life? Um, no, I really don't think so because you know it wasn't like that was a woman that was doing boxing and that was getting out there and getting exposure like that I got with Don King in the 90s. Um, so I didn't have somebody to look at and say, wow, I want to be like that person. You know, it was just, it was just kind of as the career progressed, it was one thing led to another and it, you know, just grew a little bit and then I would hang in there a little bit longer and, you know, kind of made history, I think, with, with King and, and fighting under Mike Tyson. Do you remember your first day in the boxing gym? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Um, I, I had seven professional fights before I had ever been in a boxing gym. And I, the first day in the gym was um, in Bristol, Tennessee. And that was the first time I was introduced to Jim Martin. And um, clearly from minute one, he wanted no part of training a female fighter. Uh, but he was being um, forced into doing it by the promoter who was paying Jim to also train his son. So uh, Jim didn't have a whole lot of choice but to, to kind of put up with, with me as a fighter. But, you know, as time went on, he realized that I, I did listen. And I, I, you know, when you have somebody that doesn't have any knowledge, you can see leaps and bounds of improvement day after day after day. So as a, as a teacher or trainer, that's exciting. I think anytime you teach, you can teach somebody else how to do something, you know, you, you feel personal pride. Absolutely. So you, you say you had seven pro fights before you went into the boxing gym. What, what what was you doing between them? Was you just training yourself? Was it all self taught? I I uh, I was still in college and I was playing basketball. So you know I, I had no clue what boxing was really about. So I thought if I was in basketball shape, I was in boxing shape. And and yes, I did have uh, actually hung a heavy bag in my apartment while I was in college. Uh, I, and I would hit it some. I mean I don't even remember if I like timed rounds. I, I don't. You know, I, I had no knowledge. I would watch fights and then try to emulate what I would see fighters do. Um, but it, the, the funny thing is, if people remember my career, I was really straightforward, uh, go get it, look for the knockout. But one of my favorite fighters was Hector Camacho, who was absolutely nothing like what I, how I fought. Um, but I, I like to watch him always. But I thought he was cute. What was your, looking back, what's a highlight of your professional career? Wow. Um, you know, it, it's hard to say, like, pick one particular moment. I, I know that I, I think being on the cover of Sports Illustrated was a great accomplishment. Um, being the Grand Marshal for the Boxing Hall of Fame back in 1996, uh, they had no, no uh, plan or no thought of ever having a woman fighter be inducted into the boxing hall of fame. Um, so to be the grand marshal for that and to get to meet those great, great legends that I got to meet, it was that special to me. Um, you know, fighting under Tyson all those times. I think my whole career was a highlight. I mean, not what I did in the ring, but what I did outside. Well, I'm from a small town in Southern West Virginia. We have like 500 people in my town. So um, to get to go to Vegas to fight in Madison Square Garden, those things are pretty un, um, undreamable. To flip it, what was the was there any low points in your career? What was the lowest moment in your career? 
Um, two things. One, actually taking a knee against Layla, I I wish I would have just continued to get up and and get up until they either she knocked me out or the referee stopped it. So those are the worst ten seconds of my career. But the 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 thing that I regret more than that is after having a stroke, coming back and fighting and losing to Mia St. John. That was um that that will that will hurt me um professionally and personally, I think, until my days are done. Talk to me about working with Don King. What was he like? Uh working with Don King, you know, I, I uh, uh wow. He, he, to me, he, he's the greatest promoter that's ever done it. Uh of course times have changed and now it's the social media and and you know, people say, How would King do now? Uh, it's probably less personable now in some ways. And, and King's King's thought thing is getting out there with two of the people, you know, to people could actually touch him and, 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 and you could feel his uh, energy, whether it was true or false or fake or bravado. Um, he brought energy into the room every time he came. Um, so as a fighter and now a promoter, I think I learned what not to do and how not to treat fighters. But on the flip side of it, I also learned how to promote fighters and to get them excited and how uh, I have to bring enthusiasm to every every interview and every time that I'm talking about my fights, I have to, I have to sell it. I mean, he was he was a great salesman. And you mentioned the Mayor St. John, your last fight. You were 44 years of age, I believe. Why did you continue until that age? I wanted to get that 50th win. And, um, you know, I fought Dakota Stone after being shot, just a few months after being shot and um, stabbed and left for dead. And, and I, I was 50 seconds away from the win. And I, that's what I'm telling the doctor. My hand has been broken for four rounds. And now with 50 seconds from me getting my 50 of the win, you're going to stop the fight. And, and he stopped it. And, and, you know, it's terrible because this is what he said to me. Christy, remember that uh, physicians – ringside physicians conference that you spoke at a few years ago in Orlando. And I, of course, I, you know, I say, yes, this is in my dressing room. And he said, I was at that conference and you said, we as physicians have to protect fighters from themselves. And I looked at him as serious as, as can be and said, I wasn't talking about me. I mean, you know, in his mind, he was protecting me from me, but I wasn't taking any punches. I was clearly winning the fight. If he would have just given me those 50 seconds, I don't think I would have ever fought again. And especially after having a stroke. It was it was um it was just dumb. Talk to me, you mentioned a little bit earlier about it, but that it being inducted into the Hall of Fame, how much did that mean to you? That is um being inducted into the International Boxing Hall of Fame is you know, it's just a day that I never thought I, I never thought would happen. I never thought that being inducted would happen and that um, getting that call from Ed Brophy, I, I was very excited and very like touched and moved and, and, and like just couldn't wait. And then, of course, he tells you you can't tell anybody for a few days because they have to do the publicity and all that stuff. So I'm holding it in and and I, I dealt with it. But when he called to tell me that the induction ceremony had been postponed till next year, um, I cried. Because it hurt me more that it just it, it hurt me. I had worked, you know, I worked so hard. I've been through a lot, and um, I, I was I was ready for it to be this year. I was, I was so disappointed that it's it didn't get to happen. But of course, I mean, I I clearly understand. Um, but it still sucks. Absolutely. Um, I saw a few years back there was talk of a movie being made about your life and career. I don't know if that's still in the works or if that's going on, but. Um, can you shed a light on that? Is that still going ahead? How much involvement do yes. you have in that? Yes, the movie is still moving forward. Um, of course, Corona has put um, you know everything on hold, uh, but they are still working. They've they started casting people. At one point, we had Amy Schumer on board, but um, she was actually in the gym training and everything, and found out she was pregnant. Um, so clearly, she was out, uh, and um, they 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 decided to move on and and move in a different direction, but. All you know, again, 
Corona has everything on hold and, and that's one of the things, but they, they are working behind the scenes and, and it is going to happen. It's just, when is it going to happen? How much influence do you have on the movie in terms of outside of the, inside the ring? You know, I, I don't, I really don't. And, um, I, I'm really more excited. I have a big Netflix documentary coming up and, um, again, that's been delayed. It was supposed to happen in June and and it keeps getting pushed back so it may not even happen until the first of next year um we've done all the filming but it's me i get to i get to explain my feelings i get to talk about um uh, you know the boxing the outside of boxing and and i think the netflix documentary will be more probably true the movie's going to be hollywoodized as i call it so i you know who knows how it's really going to come out is there a title for the netflix series yet uh, I think it's Christy Martin. It's Christy Martin. Perfect. Um, talk to me about you are now a promoter. You mentioned you learned a lot from Don King on that side of things. How much of Don King's influence do you carry today in your promotional company? Um, you know, King used to always tell me, you know, Christy, go out there and, and, and talk talk to him, baby. Talk to him. Tell him, you know, tell him what you're going to do. Tell him how you're going to knock him out. And, and some of that, I, I think that fire is what I try to, to bring to the promotion side of it, dealing with the media. Um, and even when I talk to fighters, young fighters, I, I try to explain to them how you have to stay ready because you never know when your phone's gonna ring. And that was the whole thing, especially early in my time with King. Um, that for a minute, I was fighting like every three weeks. I had to stay ready. I, I didn't know when he was gonna call, um, but I never wanted to tell him no, I know that. So that, that was like one of the really probably most important things that I learned that as, as a young fighter, as any fighter, um, you have to stay ready at all times. I mean, if you're a fighter, boxing is your job. So you need to, you have to stay ready. Um, but yeah, I just, I, I want, I want people to, um, to realize that I have a lot of fire, but, um, that I'm also positive and I do care about the people that are dealing with me and, and look, Loyalty means more to me than anything, and and that's what how I feel and deal with people. Gardner Payne has been a sponsor and a partner with me for uh, since I started with this crazy thing of trying to be a promoter. And and um, I, you know I, I feel like our loyalty goes back and forth to each other, and together we're gonna really we're gonna do some really good things. We have TCY uh, Argentinian TV on this for this August fifteenth event. And uh, we'll have five more fights with them. Uh, but hopefully that this shows Showtime and Fox and the people here in America that we can put together a really great show. And it will be something that the fight fans will want to watch. Has promoting been what you expected it to be before you started doing it? Um, that's a good question. I, you know, promoting is nothing like being the fighter. I mean, it's, it's not the same adrenaline it's um it, it doesn't bring the same smile to my face that um that getting ready for a fight did but it's different because now i i feel like if i can help some young fighter make it to where i did then then i'll be proud of that and i'll, I'll find some uh you know positive uh, positive vibes from from just helping somebody else and that's that's what i want to do i want to I was lucky. I was lucky, but I was also ready to take take advantage of opportunities given to me. And that's what, you know, I, I just want to be able to give some opportunities to some other young guys that are getting overlooked by, because, you know, the Mayweathers, the Arams, the this and that, the Gold Boys, they're only going to look at the very, very top, what they feel is the cream of the crop. I want people that can fight to come to me and we'll get there. We might have to work a little harder. We might have to work overtime with no pay, but we're going to get there. When was the promotional outfit established and why did you want to go into promoting? Um, I did the first fight in November of 2015. Uh, after having the stroke and, and realizing that, you know, I, I was done, I, and plus I was old. Um, it, promoting was the best way that I could stay involved in boxing. Um, it, you know, I, I I tried training some some fighters, but I, I want people to work a little harder than they probably want to work most of the time. And um, I, I think promoting is better suited for me than 
than training. Uh, I wanted to go into, if you don't mind speaking about it, the attempted murder. You touched on it earlier. Um, just sort of share the story on what happened there to you, as far as you want to go. Yeah, for, um, you know, I was married to, to Jim Martin, who was my trainer and uh, husband. And so I, I uh, for the entire 20 years, almost 20 years, I was married to him. He, he would tell me, if you leave me, I'll kill you. And, um, you know, like at the beginning, I was 22, 23 years old. And at the beginning, I kind of laughed it off. And, and But somewhere in that time, I, I realized that he wasn't joking. Uh, he would kill me if ever I left. And, and it was hard to, even though I wanted to go, I wanted to leave him really badly when my career was at the highest. But it was the hardest to, I couldn't leave then because, um, I mean, you know, I had, I, I, I had too much at stake. And, um, and on the outside, things were good. Uh, so I, I dealt with it, but finally I just decided I had had enough. I had been on cocaine daily for five, three years, I think three or four years. And I just, I just needed to get better. And, um, that's what I decided to do was to leave. And, and as I walked out the door, he said, you, if you leave, I'll kill you. And I told him, looked him straight in the eye and said, do what you have to do. And, um, when I came back, he, he, he did, he stabbed me repeatedly uh, ruptured my lung, um, pistol with me, beat me up really bad, my, cut my ear from my head. And, and then um, I guess when I didn't die fast enough, he shot me. I missed my heart by about three inches with my own pink nine millimeter. Um, but God is good. And, and I say God has a plan for me. And that's why I'm still here. So I was able to get out and get to the hospital and you know, the rest is history. Absolutely. And thank God you did. Um... Did you believe that he would attempt to kill you when you left? Absolutely. I mean, I, I knew that um, before I went back, I actually went and saw some of my friends, and, and they didn't know, but I was telling them goodbye. And um, and then right before I went into the house, I, I pulled over and I called um, my best friend Donna, and, and um, of course she told me, don't go back, he's crazy. And I told her, you know what, I have to. I have to either go and, and live or die. You know, I'll never be free. And um, that's just where I was. And, and I was good with it. I was good with it. Either way, live or die. It didn't matter to me until about halfway through. After he'd already stabbed me, he was pistol whipping me. And I told him then, I said, motherfucker, you cannot kill me. And I meant it, just like the sun came up this morning. And I don't think he could have. I mean, he would have to have done extreme, you know, extreme to kill me. Um, you know, for whatever reason. I decided I wasn't ready to die. And um, like I said, God is good and, and got me out of there. And I, I feel like it saved me to, to talk about domestic violence and to really spread awareness and, and that people don't understand what goes on behind closed doors always. You know, I'm sure from the outside looking in, a lot of people thought, wow, Christy Martin has it made. And she, you know, she's getting a fight on the, you know, fighters, you know, they look at it like you're getting a fight, you're getting this opportunity. They had no idea that hell I was li living in behind closed doors. Where's your mental health at at that stage? And, you know, you summon the courage to go back to leave him. Halfway through, you're going, do you know what? You're not going to do it. What, what's going on in your mind? Where's your mental health at, at this stage? At this stage, I still, um, you know, we're coming up on 10 years. And, and, and from, from word go, when I would see different counselors, I would always ask them, how long does it take? How long does it take to get over it? And um, just recently, my counselor, she's like, Chrissy, you have to forgive him. And and forgiving him will set you free. And I'm like, ugh, you know, I just don't know if I can. How do you forgive somebody that tried to kill you? But even when you look back at it, or I look back at it, I, that's not even the, to me, that's not the worst thing he did to me. The worst thing was the 20 years of just mental and emotional beatdown and, and negativity and, and you know like I'm on the cover of Sports Illustrated and he tells me why it had nothing to do with me it was all about him um that my whole thing with Don King was all because he was a great negotiator it had nothing to do with him being a, a great negotiator it had nothing to do with him period um but he convinced me all these things he convinced me my family hated me he convinced me my friends hated me um uh, but this is what abusers do and and they turn it to where for the longest time, and, and still even today, I deal with, is it my fault? 
no, it's not my fault. I did not pull the trigger. I did not stab me. I did not do any of that stuff to me. It's not my fault. Are you happy today? I'm happy today. I'm happily married to Lisa Hollowine and um, um, she's, she's, she's strong. She's strong. And, and when she sees me um, folding a little, uh, she's always there to, to pick me up and, and, you know, she says to me, if you could just see you through my eyes and through other people's eyes, um, you would feel better. And, and I, you know, I, I say someday I will someday I'll find that confidence, but I was beat down for a long, long time. And very finally, Christy, what's the future hold for yourself in the sport? What are your ambitions? My ambitions are, are simple. It's just like as a fighter, I want to promote champions. I want to be, um, you know, it took me a long time as a, as a fighter. I had to pay my dues. I had to pay my dues. That's what I'm doing now. I'm paying my dues. And I will find the champion. And I will. you will be seeing Christy Mark Promotions on Showtime, on Fox Sports. Um, we will get there. Alberto Palmetta is a great 147. Actually, he's, he's really excited. Uh, I think he's going to move down to 140. He's, he's kind of short like me. So it'll be to his advantage to, to move down to 140. Uh, exciting. Uh, uh, we have Tor Francisco Torres on the show. Exciting. Um, this show is, is the best one I put together. I think it's number 15, and it's the best one of the 15. Fantastic. That's everything I wanted to ask you. Was there anything that I've missed out at all, anything that you want to add? I think that's it. You know, we get a good plug for the fight, and um, if anybody wants to buy tickets for the fight, they can go to eventbrite.com. Fantastic. Christy, thank you very much for your time. I've uh, been trying to get hold of you for the last five years. What I've been doing this. Oh, I'm sorry. No, that's I'm fine. easy. I'm out there. I'm out there. <laughs> but thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. And it's, um, it's, it's been good. Thank you. Have a great day. And you.